My name is Nicolas Bobrinsky. This is my journey with the European Space Agency and the European Space Operations Center. ESA employs some of the world leading scientists, engineers and experts. They are spread across different programs in Europe and around the world. Over the span of several decades, I have accompanied space safety and deep space communication on its journey from its beginning as a small seed, through the innovation it produced to becoming one of ESA's fastest growing programs. In this video series, I am sharing stories and memories and some lessons I have learned along the way in my 35 year career in space. I hope that you watching will be inspired to become part of the next generation of the European space industry and you will go forward with curiosity, passion and confidence. When we are talking about innovation, there are many events which happen, uh, which are triggered by, by innovation. But one of them I, I remember very well is about uh, the Ulysses probe and the way uh, we have put in place a very still early version of the, of the ESA tracking stations network uh, to, uh, to be able for the first time to, uh, to track satellites in deep space, in deep space orbits. Ulysses was a very interesting mission. Uh, targeted a scientific mission targeted at the observation of the southern and northern poles of the of the sun and it was a, also a beautiful cooperation between ESA and NASA and in order to do this the only possibility was to capture the data from Ulysses using the American Deep Space Stations network of 70 meter antennas very very large antennas which had the capacity to uh, communicate with this uh, with this satellite which was flying at hundreds of millions of kilometers uh, away from the earth, from the earth. Uh, and then a few years later uh, it was uh, seen as possible to uh, make a communication test also with uh, a newly erected ESA antenna which was ready in uh, 1992 which was the, located in Kourou which was a small 15 meter station and uh, the idea was to say why don't we try to make a communication test with this Ulysses probe. We made this test, although many people were saying that we were a bit losing our time, that uh, never, never a small antenna of 15 meters would be able to communicate with a deep space probe at hundreds of millions of kilometers. But with colleagues here at ESOC, we have very, very carefully made our uh, uh, mathematical calculations and we have seen that it, is, it was mathematically possible. So we said, let's make it. And uh, the, the test was done and uh, after many difficulties, the test was successful. Although, of course, we had to wait for 20 minutes sometimes to, to, for the signal to, uh, to, to reach the spacecraft and then to come back another 20 minutes, which was a very, very long time. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the test was fully successful. And this also raised a lot of excitement at, uh, at Kourou, which was more used to, uh, to launch our events launch events or communication with uh, near-Earth satellites rather than with uh, deep space satellites. And this has actually triggered the possibility and the decision which was taken in either councils and uh, governing bodies to uh, invest, to invest uh, for the first time in a deep space antenna of 30 meters, 35 meters, which will then later be located in uh, New Norcia in uh, Western Australia. Sometimes crazy ideas are coming with uh, some resistance yeah, from, from colleagues or from, uh, from superiors. Sometimes when you have a good idea or you think you are convinced it's a good idea, stick to it, try to make it happen, convince other people. And this is uh, something which I think we, with the colleagues who were part of this experiment, experiment we did uh, with a lot of enthusiasm. ESA has decided to go ahead with uh, extremely challenging space missions like Rosetta, or Mars Express or Venus Express and many others in the, at the later stage. So this was really part of the science program. And uh, to fly these missions at uh, distances which were extremely high from the, from, the, from the Earth, it was necessary to rely on a network of deep space antennas. And uh, the first antenna of this type was decided to be placed in, uh, in Australia at a location called uh, New Norcia. We knew already the people, we knew already um, 
that we could uh, rely also on the Australian support yeah, to, to run these uh, stations. We just wanted a station a bit larger than what we already had. And uh, for this, we needed, of course, a new location. So started then the, uh, also which, uh, something which was really a, a big adventure, which was the, the, the need to find and identify a suitable location for this deep space antenna, which was extremely difficult to do. You cannot place such an antenna in the middle of the city. You need to take care about the frequencies and the frequency uh, um, interactions with uh, other, other users. And uh, eventually it was uh, uh, found possible to put this antenna in, um, in New North, which is located uh, uh, approximately 150 kilometers north of, uh, of the Perth city. It, uh, was, uh, it was indeed a challenge to uh, make sure it would be possible to, uh, to have a permanent contact between uh, the deep space stations of ESA and the probes which we were flying. And to do this, we needed to have antennas uh, all around the globe. And in particular, there was the need to have something in the, uh, at the longitudes of, uh, of Australia. And uh, without this, it would not be possible to keep this permanent contact and therefore also uh, um, fly these missions in an independent way. Uh, by placing a, an antenna, a deep space antenna, in a, in a strategic location like Western Australia, it was possible to um, somehow close the gap. Close the gap of communication and, in addition to Europe and later South America, to, to have a global network of deep space antennas. And therefore keep a permanent contact with our deep space missions. The network of deep space antennas in, uh, uh, in, in Australia and then later in, in other places in Europe and South America has benefited to a very large number of, uh, of missions, of uh, mostly science and exploration missions of ESA. Uh, some of them being well known like uh, Rosetta, Mars Express, Venus Express, uh, the famous uh, Cassini uh, Huygens um, uh, mission, which was a cooperation between ESA and NASA, and many, many others. And uh, today also we are uh, exclusively relying on these missions, on these antennas, to, uh, to fly our future missions as well, uh, in deep space in particular. It is very important to, um, to consider the fact and maybe the natural resistance yeah, which we have in the space organizations about sharing critical information or sharing a, a new um, element or result of an innovation which we have developed in the agency and keep it for ourselves. Uh, however, we need to remember that if we keep these type of things for ourselves, we will not get also the information from others available to us. And um, sometimes putting the critical information together um, makes it possible to achieve something much, much bigger than, than what you would achieve if you would do the things completely in isolation. And um, these developments, therefore, done uh, in the case of ESA, between the member states, give the possibility to uh, develop absolutely fantastic systems which would not be conceivable for any individual space agency within, uh, within Europe. And this, of course, applies also to a wider extent to with uh, other international cooperation with other space agencies. In terms of uh, risk in the domain of, uh, of space stations and uh, ground stations for, uh, for, for the space missions, uh, there is one aspect which is absolutely fundamental. It's uh, uh, really the, the communication between the stations and, uh, and the spacecraft. And the worst thing which can, can happen to a mission is the loss of communication between the spacecraft and its uh, control center via the, the ground stations network. And this is something uh, where we, we, which, uh, which happened in the past in one of our missions, which is the Eureka mission. Eureka was a collaborative mission between ESA and NASA. And uh, it stands for the European Retrievable Carrier. It was launched in 92, it has lasted two years, um, and it was launched by a, by a shuttle. And um, one of the critical areas uh, or domains of the missions was to release this uh, platform from the shuttle and put it in the, in the final orbit. And uh, during this release, it was important to send some very, very uh, fundamental commands to the, to the platform to activate it. And this was done uh, via three stations, which were then put uh, on purpose for this. One of them was the Perth station in, uh, in Australia. The second one was uh, the Mas Paloma station in Gran Canaria, Spain. And the third was, uh, one was in Kourou in French Guiana. And uh, there were some new protocols resulting from innovation from new studies which were put in place between the stations and the platform. And these uh, protocols for communication were not yet very well established, very solid, and uh, were a little bit unstable. 
And uh, unfortunately, um, the two first contacts with the Perth station and the uh, Mas Paloma station failed. It was not possible to establish communication with the platform. And we were then over the, the pass with Kuru and uh, a few minutes were left before the critical commands could be released. If these commands were not released, it was then uh, necessary to, um, to further delay the mission or probably even to, uh, to cancel this. And then therefore bring back uh, the Eureka to, 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 to the Earth. And uh, really during the last moment of this pass over Kuru, when the, uh, the, the, the spacecraft was already descending, yeah, to, towards the horizon, it was possible in the last moment to send the command and to activate the necessary part of the, the, the Eureka platform. And in the end, this mission was a success and uh, has lasted its nominal two years. In 2012, we had the ministerial conference in, uh, in Naples, and uh, it was a very important uh, conference uh, for the SSA program. We were finishing the preparatory program and starting the second period of the program. And there were some complications in the, in the way the program proposal content was, uh, uh, had to be updated, uh, resulting in, uh, in updated versions of the program declaration as well, where the commitments are recorded. And um, there were many changes and uh, uh, the time was getting short. And, uh, Without this declaration approved, finalized, signed off, we would not have been able to, uh, to start the program and we would have to stop it. Uh, we had to chase the delegates all around the conference center and convene an extraordinary program board to be able to obtain the vote and validate all the changes which were necessary, get them signed by our director general. And then finally, on this basis, we were able to uh, agree and continue the second period of the SSA program. Without this, we would have to stop the program. This means that uh, today the space safety would uh, have not happened. The continuation would have been at total risk.